So we're very, very enthusiastic and, and excited with this conversation. So my name is Esra Tat. I will be your host for today's conversation on food contact materials. Uh, I'm the Associate Director at Ceres Europe. Uh, a few words on Ceres Europe. Um, we are a Brussels-based um, NGO, um, network-based NGO with members in uh, 31, uh, 31 members, sorry, in uh, 27 countries. Um, the core of our work is advocacy work on EU policy. Uh, we work on implementation of zero strategies at the local level and on movement building and coordination. Uh, so Zero is Europe Live, this, uh, this series um, is running once a month um, and we cover topics on all waste related issues, circular economy from policy uh, to implementation. So for today's topic, um, we are going to talk about food contact materials. Um, as we, we said, um, it's one of this topic uh, that is perceived as a bit technical and we're really happy to see the, the enthusiasm in the registrant and, and participants now. Um, what do we mean by food contact materials? Um, it covers from packaging to tableware, kitchen utensils and food processing requirements. All of this contains, we know, thousands of chemicals. Um, those chemicals, uh, some of them are hazardous, can migrate to food and impact human health. As consumers, we tend to assume that we are protected, uh, notably through regulation, but are we really? And if not, what can we do about it? Or what is happening today on this question? So for this webinar, we will be diving into the chemicals found in food contact materials uh, that have um, affected human health, um, but also have an impact on recycling in the circular economy. Uh, you may wonder now what is the connection between these uh, different elements. And um, I'm happy that we have today three speakers who will help us understand everything, or at least give you a first starter on the food contact material topic. We will be in this conversation um, exploring the migration of hazardous chemicals. Uh, we will be talking about the lack of traceability, transparency. Um, we'll be talking about EU um, policy framework and also give you a sense of what is happening today at the local and national level. Um, so for that, uh, we have three fantastic and complimentary speakers. Um, uh, just for the flow of this um, webinar, we usually have 10 minute presentation, then we have 10 minute clarification questions. So please feel free to use the Q&A chat box to do so. Um, and we um, then at the end, protect half an hour to have a conversation um, with the, the panelists. Um, a brief introduction, our three panelists today are um, Cizel Duker from uh, ChemTrust. Cizel is the science and policy consultant. Uh, she will give us an introduction to chemical and, um, and food contact materials. Uh, we'll then have the chance to have my colleague, Justine Mayo, who is the consumption and production campaigner at the Restrop and also the policy coordinator of the Briefing Plastic Alliance. Um, Justine will make us um, clarify also first the connection with the Green Deal and the, uh, the supply economy and, and, and explain what challenges we, we face. And our last speaker is um, Raul uh, Banyawa, uh, who is an expert at uh, Red Zero. And uh, Raul will give us um, an example of uh, a campaign that has been uh, uh, run in Spain and, and also clarify a bit more what is happening um, at the local level. So without further delay, um, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Cizel, to uh, take us into the um, quite interesting world of uh, food contact materials and, uh, and chemicals. Okay, thank you very much, Ezra. I will try to share my screen now with you. You can tell me if you see it here. Yes, absolutely. You see it. I'll just start from the beginning here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today to present some basic problems with the legislation on food contact materials in the EU or on the FCM, as we often just call them, using the abbreviation. My talk will give you an introduction to, to chemicals and the basic problems with the EU chemicals legislation. And I will also say a few words about a research project that ChemTrust has been involved in 
And finally, I represent five key principles for better legislation, which was developed by a group of NGOs. First, I would like to give you just a few words about ChemTrust. We are an NGO, a charity. We work with, uh, in the EU and globally to protect humans and wildlife from harmful chemicals. We work with scientists and decision makers, and we work in partnership with other civil society groups. Our main focus is on the endocrine disrupting chemical. And so to move on to today's issue, what is a food contact material? Eshwa, you said a little bit about it already just now. It is a material which is intended to be brought into contact with food or already in contact with food or something that can reasonably be expected to be brought into contact with food. This is uh, the legal definition. And what is important to know about the FCM is that they all contain chemicals. It's important to know that these chemicals can migrate into our food and that some of these chemicals are hazardous to our health or to the environment. This has been acknowledged by leg legislators uh, in the EU for many years. And, and the EU has developed different measures to try to ensure consumer safety. safety. This slide you see here provides a, an overview of the laws on FGM, which are currently in place in the European Union. It's like a bouquet of different laws. And as you can see, we have the framework regulation uh, 1935 from 2004 as the umbrella and moreover there are several additional regulations <clears throat> sorry you may notice here also that a significant amount of the rules are related specifically to plastics this is the lower vertical branch you see there and you can also notice maybe that other well-known materials are missing you don't see any general rules for paper and board, and you don't see anything on metals or printing inks and so on. But still, the rules are quite complicated. And just by my talk today, I will actually not go through all the different elements, but only do just shortly, I'll recall the basic safety measure of the framework regulation. And then I will focus on what is missing from the laws. I'm <clears throat> sorry, so the basic, Framework regulation on food contact material in EU starts in the beginning with, uh, with a basic safety rules. And it says that materials and articles shall be manufactured in such a way that the chemicals in them do not transfer to the, to the food in quantities that would endanger human health or cause unacceptable change in the composition of the food or change the smell or taste. This is the organoleptic characteristics. And if you look at this, you could surely say that if all suppliers complied with this rule, everything could be fine. But one of the main problems with the current laws is that they do not specify what the suppliers must do to tell that a material is safe. It's only, only for, almost only for the plastic that you have more implementing legislation has been developed where you talk about what does it mean that a material is safe. For plastic, there's a positive list with about 1,000 substances that are authorized for use in plastic. And these are often authorized with a migration limit. And now I would move on to the problems. I have summarized here those issues that I think are the most important. And as you can see, it's all about what is missing from the current legislation. And I would like to just take you through the points here. First point is the lack of harmonized rules. As I, as I already mentioned, there are no harmonized European use on paper or ink or glue or metal or other chemicals, other materials and so on. This means that there's no EU legislation controlling the use of the hazardous substances in these materials. Another main problem is the lack of information transfer in the supply chain for FCM. There's no really effective obligation on the suppliers to deliver information to the customers in the FCM supply chain. For harmonized materials, which is almost only the plastic, there's an obligation to deliver a so-called declaration of compliance. And this states that the product is legal. 
but there's no obligation to pass on information on how the safety has been assessed or which chemicals have been used. A third point, which is also often mentioned in the discussion on FGM, is the NIAS, the non-intentionally added substance. These are chemicals that are formed during processing, processing and storage, and uh, they are not, uh, often not identified or tested, even though they may migrate from the final food contact articles in very large volumes. But unfortunately, the traditional system is to look at the starting substances, and there, there's no tradition to look as, at any other substances. And this is also what you do for plastic. You look at the starting material. Fourth point it is lack of adequate safety data assessment, where even for, for plastics, where, where some data are required, there's no routine assessment of important health points, such as the endocrine disruptors or uh, effects such as neurotoxicity effects and immunotoxicity effects. Last point, the lack of control of enforcement. And it's quite clear that when you have unclear definition of safety and weight placing of, respon of responsibility, this makes enforcement very difficult. <clears throat> and there's also some practical problems with enforcement that there are missing test methods for testing the, the the final material and so on. So summing up, in my view, there's really a need for these problems to be more widely known. But I find also that it's often very not easy to explain the problems to the public in a short and easy way. And having said that, I can move on to the next issue. I can say to you, Eshwa, I cannot see the chat, so you will have to tell me uh, if I if yes, I'm waiting. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So I can move on to the next issue. I was asked uh, to talk about a little bit other issue. I asked about to, to say a few words about the, so the project on hazardous chemicals in plastic packaging. It's a multi-research project with several elements that Chemtrust has participated in together with the Food Packaging Forum and several others. Um, Today, I will just talk shortly about the database that was developed during this project. Um, I should also just quickly highlight that this product, project is not only on food packaging, but on all kinds of packaging. But still, it might be interesting from a recycling point of view. During this project, <clears throat> uh, more than 4,000 chemicals used in plastic packaging was identified. And the database uh, collected information from 14 publicly available sources. But as you can see here, it was still difficult for the scientists from Food Packaging Forum to really find information on where, whether each substance was actually used in packaging or not. So they had 900 that they found were likely used in plastic packaging and, and uh, more than 3,000 substances that were possibly used in plastic packaging. The author then also looked at the hazards of these substances. And, uh, and they found that uh, out of the 900 substances, uh, they could say that 63 ranked high for health hazards. These are the ones in the red circle here. And 68 ranked high for environmental hazards when looking at the classifications and, and other data. Uh, the main message from this project was that lack of available information was a serious problem from the, for the work. And that clearly, you, as you can see, many hazardous chemicals are still used in plastic packaging. And moreover, uh, the project actually um, prioritized the phthalates for further studies which is also quite interesting as we have, I think we will hear another study about salads today, as I understand. And actually, uh, just this morning, I heard that the food packaging firm is also working on a database exactly on uh, food, co food contact chemicals. And I think this other new database, I don't know if it's published yet, it will cover uh, around 11,000 chemicals. And now, just to finish my talk, I will go back again to the, to the food contact materials. Um, I'd like to just uh, finish by presenting um, 
five key principles that was developed by a group of NGOs last year. It was uh, ChemTrust together with the six other NGOs and Food Packaging Forum. We developed five key principles, or you could say five top priorities for the future legislation on HCM. And this work was, was really inspired by the Commission's recent positive step to start evaluating the food contact material legislation. And after we had developed the five key principles, many more organizations signed on, and you can also sign on. You can go to the ChemTrust website and you can read more about it. I have just summarized here the, the five key principles in short form. Uh, what we say is that we need a reform uh, on food contact materials in the EU, which must ensure these five uh, key points a high level of protection of human health, a thorough assessment of chemicals in materials and final articles, effective enforcement, and of course also transparency and participation. It's important that both the, the customers in the food, food contact material supply chain and also the consumers have information about what chemicals are really in the products that they're using and buying. And just to finish my 10 minutes talk, I could say that like many other stakeholders, ChemTrust is eager to see a proposal for new legislation from the commission. We call for a full reform, which could ensure safe food and safe packaging and ensure food contact materials without harmful chemicals. And we hope that the commission will soon propose new legislation which will be able to handle what is missing today. And we can only hope for and work for a modern legislation on FCM based on the key principles and other good ideas to solve the problems. So with that, I say thank you and I look forward to hear the other presentations and of course, any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you can uh, stop sharing your screen or maybe Keep it. Uh, we might oh. reshare it after, uh, but it's okay. it's okay. There, are. Uh, okay. thanks a lot. It's ten minutes to to take us through the the question of the migration, the chemicals, the the policy framework, um, and what needs to be done or could be done. I think it's it it's a lot. So it's really an introduction. And I there was a, a comment. I think it's it's a clarification um, on the different level of framework. So the comment was, but we do have legislation at the local level. Uh, why should be a regional regulation be better than a good existing national legislation? And it was uh, your your slide where you listed the different um, lack of traceability and transparency. Could you elaborate a bit on this? Yes, and it's true that that the, of course the the member states in the EU can have uh, local legislation on food contact materials, and many of them do. And uh, there was a report made in 2016, which, uh, which was made by the Joint Research Center by the Commission, uh, looking at the non-harmonized materials. And I would really, if anybody is interested in knowing what is the situation for the non-harmonized materials, you should really look into this report. What is most often said is that for the companies, it's really, really, really complicated to have a internal market when you have 27 different kinds of rules and some of the member states have, have much stricter rules than others and some member states focus on different materials like uh, actually uh, in Germany they have some recommendations for paper and board and for printing ink and I think in the Netherlands they are more interested in coatings and varnishes and generally what we see today is that even at national level, we don't see very elaborate safety rules. We see more like a, mitch, a mismatch of different rules from the different 27 different countries. Thank you very much. Um, I, see, I see more questions. Please reproduce the Q&A uh, box for your, for your question. Um, there's one related to EFSA. Uh, we're going to keep that one for a later presentation. Um, but there's another one that relates to uh, chemicals and producers. So I'm going to read, it, uh, read that one for you, um, Cizel. 
why the chemicals used in plastic packaging are hard to identify. Producers, do they not want to communicate them to protect their know-how? Is there technical issues to identify them? Uh, or is it an issue of the complex chain between producers of plastic granulates to the final packaging user? Any other reasons? Like, why is it hard to identify? Well, I think uh, that was also, uh, in many ways, a surprise to the food packaging form. And my immediate response would be that it's a little bit of all those reasons that you mentioned there, maybe. Uh, definitely, there's a confidential business information issue in it. <clears throat> and there's also a, a, just a lack of information transfer through the, through the supply chain on it. And uh, generally, you can say in chemicals policy that unless you have rules that say you have to pass on information, you will see that information is not passed on in a general term, I would say that. Okay. And from the technical side, do you also see challenges in identifying the chemicals? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's sometimes it's difficult for, for, for test laboratories to really find out if, if they make a test on a, a specific material to find out what are the, the chemicals that they find in that material. That is often a matter of test methods or test standards. Um, some chemicals you can identify and some you cannot. And uh, often it's very much work. So in that way, it would, I think, certainly be easier if you could get more information from those that have originally made the material because they know what's in it. Thank you. Um, there are some comments that uh, reinforce what you were saying on the, the different um, uh, policy framework and uh, also the, the national level. And one of the comments saying that uh, we should also, I mean, that it should be followed by all member states, but it's not that everyone does it necessarily. Uh, could be one of the, the challenge. Um, I see two other questions that are mostly related to the question of recycling. And, and I think we're going to talk a bit more about this after. Um, so I propose that we move on. If you have still questions that relate to this presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A. We'll have time to discuss yeah. and answer them later. Thank you very much, Cizel. Um, Thank you. I think it's it's time to move on to our second presentation from uh, Justine Mayo. Um, so Justine, you will be um, helping us to understand a bit more the solutions part um, beyond maybe banning uh, some of these chemicals, talking about um, the reusables the, uh, around food packaging, but also connect for us this whole conversation with the EU Green Deal. Um, so I'll let you, Justine, share your screen and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Good afternoon, everyone. I think you can now see my screen. Um, and indeed, um, as Ezra mentioned, I will go a bit more into the link uh, with the secular economy topic. So um, as Ezra mentioned, Zero Waste Europe is a network um, really working together towards the elimination of waste from um, our society. And within this work, um, we, we work a lot on moving away from disposability, looking at production and consumption patterns, and especially on, on packaging. And in that context, we're very much looking into the environmental impacts of packaging, but also the health impact. And that's, that's where the, the work on FCM kind of goes in, into our work. Um, so maybe to um, start with, um, we, um, we have FCMs basically everywhere in our daily lives. Uh, those pictures are, are just uh, a few examples of, of FCMs you can uh, see um, everywhere every day. And I would say that as we've moved into a culture of even more packaging, um, or food is even more in contact with, uh, with FCM than it was maybe uh, 50 years ago. If we think about the fact that fruits and vegetables, for example, uh, are overpackaged. And um, as, as Sid have mentioned, there's this question around uh, the safety of, of those, um, of those um, FCM. And the question we can ask ourselves is whether all those food contact materials are actually equal in terms of safety. And indeed, uh, the answer is not that simple. It's actually pretty much a complex answer. 
uh, because it will really depend on what type of chemicals are actually present uh, in, in those uh, packaging and all uh, other food contact materials. So are those chemicals uh, have endocrine disrupting uh, properties? Can they have impact on our immune system? Can they be cancerogenic, etc.? And also it will depend on their likelihood to migrate uh, from material. It also very much depends on what we call the inertness of the material that is linked to the stability of the material. So we know um, that some materials like glass and stainless steel are more inert material that's just linked to their chemical composition. Um, and which means that less migration is likely from those materials to the food. But other materials like plastic um, often and paper, for example, are much less inert, more permeable and so there's also a chance that more chemicals will migrate from those type of packaging and also that maybe chemicals that would be on the other side of the packaging would actually go through uh, the paper packaging for example into the food um, and and we know and if we look into our supermarkets a lot of packaging those days are very complex they're multi-layered they mix a number of materials so if we think about carton beverages they will have actually paper aluminum, plastic. Um, if you look at cans, you think, oh, it's metal. Well, actually there's a plastic lining in it. So it makes everything much more complex. And sometimes you will have the main uh, part of the packaging that is one, um, only one material, but then the lead will be something else. And so it raises really a number of questions on the, the chemicals and, and that increased the exposure um, of to, for, for us uh, of chemicals through uh, through food contact material. And one other key element is the condition of use. Um, so uh, for example, if you reheat uh, something in the microwave in a certain container, there may be then more risk of migration of those chemicals into the food, depending on the type of food. So fatty food is actually kind of attracting those chemicals and then there's more risk again here. So we see it's, it's a complex issue. Um, but it definitely raises questions on both for our environment and, and for our health. And in view of this uh, kind of situation, we see more and more uh, initiatives uh, trying to explore uh, the move towards like toxic free and reusable packaging that will be both uh, protecting our health and our environment. Um, so those are just a few examples. Uh, for example, tiffin boxes that are in stainless steel, and basically a refillable system. And we see more and more um, restaurants through them in Brussels, for example, the concepts comes from India, but it's developing in Europe. Um, the bottles uh, at the bottom of the, the picture are just examples of a company, uh, Jean Bouteille, which started in France and is uh, growing across Europe where they provide uh, those, the, those bottles um, for different range of, of products. And what is uh, similar, I would say in, in those different examples is that you, that you mix reusability and, and DRS system. So usually they would go for reusable materials that are in inert, um, inert containers. Um, so glass or stainless steel, and then there will be a system where it goes back through a deposit return scheme uh, to the producer to be sanitized and then it can be refilled again. So those are examples of initiatives that are um, explored at the moment. Uh, but what we know as well is that while we explore for alternatives, we also really need to be careful on for solution. And, and what we have seen um, is also um, regrettable substitution in some cases where some chemicals have been replaced by another chemical that is actually as hazardous. So we've seen that a lot with bisphenol. Bisphenol A has been um, removed from a number of, of chemicals, yet it's been re uh, replaced by bisphenol S, AF, many others, and we now have concerns really about the health uh, implication of those chemicals. What we can also see is uh, replacing one single use by another, and with a number of rules, uh, and increased rules on, on single-use plastics. Um, instead of switching to reusables, we also see a switch to single-use paper, for example, or new materials. While we know that there's also health issues with single-use paper, and as Sitsum actually mentioned earlier, uh, paper is even less regulated than plastic when it comes to chemicals uh, in food contact material. So that, that really raises questions. And also there's, there's a lack of information of a lot around new materials that are developed for food packaging. 
Uh, one thing we really need to be careful about is preventing toxic recycling, um, because obviously, uh, as we move to a circular economy, the role of recycling is very important. Um, and the integration of recycled content is a very good objective, and we see more and more uh, EU targets around that. Uh, but we also need to make sure that this recycled content is safe. And the problem that we have, uh, that also Cynthia mentioned, is because there's lack of information along the value chain, sometimes the waste managers, the recyclers, they're not really sure what they're actually recycling. And it really creates uh, problems. And we've, we've seen a number of um, tests on consumer products, uh, notably from recycled paper, with, a, with really high amounts of mineral oils, and that, that's really a, a threat to, to health, just to give an example. Um, so basically what we see is that it's a very complex issue and the EU legislation should make sure that everything that is put on the market, be it single use, be it uh, or reusable, or be it from virgin material or from, um, or from recycled material should be safe. And it, it, it's the objective of the FCM regulation, but at the moment it doesn't ensure that. Um, and so I, I want to highlight as well the need to really strengthen the EU rules. Um, and building on, on what was said in, in the first presentation, um, very recently in March, there was a very strong call from a group of scientists that um, um, developed this statement um, and really calling for more transparency and for action globally because there's a lack of, of rules globally. Um, and linked to this statement, there, there was a declaration of concerns signed by more than 200 organizations calling for um, decision makers to really increase the, the trustability and, and ensure stronger rules. And I would say that um, those calls are also shared by uh, the European Parliament, for example, that in several re resolutions now has called for the European Commission to act on this. Many part of the industry is also raising the, the issue. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, what Sitzel has said, but there's, there's key elements, like the lack of harmonized rule is, is, is a problem in the sense that it means a very diverse level of protection. So indeed, in some countries, um, they may have taken strong rules and that's very good, but then in other countries, it's not the case. And then you have the problem that because we have free circulation of goods in the EU, then the, you can use the, the lower standards in a way. Um, as mentioned, the risk assessments are very much focusing on the substances rather than the final products. And so that means that some elements like the NIAS are not taken into account. And for example, when we do the risk assessment, we don't take into account the fact that we also exposed to chemicals from other sources like pesticides, air pollution, and that's not taken into account. Other, the lack of consistency with other legislation. And so for example, some restricted uh, chemicals on the reach are not restricted in, under FCM. That's a, another problem. And as mentioned already, the lack of traceability is really during uh, the circular economy and the rec recycling processes. But yet it's not all gloomy because there, there's really now an opportunity uh, to change that. Um, Sidza mentioned an evaluation that was carried out last, uh, last year. And we know the European Commission is, is really looking at options now. Uh, we also feel that the farm to fork strategy really offers uh, an opportunity to really set a strong direction and to show how reforming the FCM legislation can contribute to the sustainable, to the transition to sustainable food system. And overall, with the, the European Green Deal at the moment, we really have uh, an opportunity to link those different policies together and making sure that, for example, the circular economy action plan and the move uh, increase recycled content, et cetera, is completely consistent and complementary to a strong new FCM regulation. So that basically, we can ensure that all FCM are circular, but also uh, safe for use, for reuse, and for recycling. So I'll just finish with a few priorities uh, from Zero Waste Europe when it comes to you know, calling the EU for action. So the, the key thing is obviously uh, start an ambitious reform of the EU legislation uh, to address um, the, the insufficiencies that were carried out um, also based on the principle that it's all uh, mentioned earlier so that we can ensure a uniform uh, and high level of protection of the human health and allow a, a toxic critical economy. And as mentioned, uh, really this reform FCM should be part of other legislation and should be um, complementary to other policies looking at sustainable products, reducing uh, packaging waste to really 
um, move towards a short supply chain and local ed and resilient food systems. And finally, there should be support uh, for developing new business models and innovative solutions that uh, both ensure circularity and, and safety. So looking into reusable uh, safe packaging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justine. Thank you. Um, and thanks for keeping the time perfectly. Um, we have a few questions. Um, and I don't know if, if um, Cecil, you would like also to, to, to jump in um, for some of them. So we might also keep them for later. But uh, there was one on the, the, what could be the best materials for reusable systems? Uh, the question is glass and metal can be heavy, plastic can have the chemical migration problems. What are considered currently the best solutions? Thank you. And um, indeed, um, there's many factors to take into account. And I think it goes uh, beyond the product, the system in which it is, um, it is embedded in. Because I think if we look at safety, um, glass and stainless steel, for example, are better options. Uh, but then we need to make sure um, they belong to a rather shorter supply chain because obviously glass is heavy. So it, if it has to be transported uh, kilometers and kilometers away, then there's this question around emissions, etc. cetera. Um, so it's really about making sure, for example, uh, those deposit return scheme system uh, can, can remain into a quite small range. And I think what is really important is also the reuse, like a glass for reuse, then um, it, it makes more sense than glass for recycling also in terms of emission. Thank you. So going back on the redesigning the system and not only the product. Um, there's a question about um, the EFSA. So I'm not sure if, if you would be able to um, answer that one if other um, panelists would like to. Um, how does EFSA implement the principle that 99 95% of food packaging waste aimed for food grade recycled material is actually food packaging. And maybe if you want to clarify for people who might not be aware of any of this conversation. Um, Cecil, if you want to start, I can compliment up to you. Yes, maybe we can compliment each other. Well, I know that EFSA has, a, there's a system where if you want to recycle a plastic material, you have to get an authorization for the process. So what EFSA does is that they look at the processes for recycling and then they authorize that. And I'm not sure how company specific that process would be, uh, if it's a process that only one company is doing or if as soon as you have uh, authorized the process, then many companies can use it. But it's in place and you can find more information on, on EFSA's website. EFSA is the European Food uh, Safety Authority, which, which is in charge of, of risk assessing uh, food contact materials. And uh, you can look at their website for more information. But there's also here a problem, I think, of delay in, in, in EFSA's capacity because the, there's a lot of authorizations that has, a lot of authorizations that have been applied for, but EFSA has not really gone through them all as far as I know. So I think it's something that suddenly there will be a lot of authorizations coming out uh, we might expect. I don't know if you agree, Justine. Yes, completely. I think it sums it uh, well. It's that it's important, I think, to understand that for recycled plastic, it's not a list of, of recycled plastic that will be allowed. It's really about the recycling processes. Um, so they really give an authorization uh, based on the fact that they, they, they follow a number of, uh, of rules and that the cleaning process is good enough, et cetera. Um, and then you can find a list uh, online of exactly who is allowed in the EU uh, to recycle for, for food contact. Thank you very much. Um, there are a few more questions on recycled plastics. Um, maybe we'll take that one as a clarification. And um, so, do you have any idea about the usage of recycled plastics as FCM? And if so, what is the level of chemical migration? Um, so I don't think we have exact numbers. Um, for plastic at the moment, it's mainly PET um, that is uh, recycled for, for food contacts. Um, so for example, bottles to bottles is something that is, is developing uh, a lot and that is likely to develop more because PET transparent PET is one of the cleaner plastic. Um, 
And so on the level of, of migration, uh, the thing is then there's no test on, on the on the on the recycled contents again. So and it's linked to the fact that we don't test the final article, we test the substance and we give an authorization for the for the substance at the origin, but then we don't test the final bottle, for example. Um, and so we even less test the, the recycled bottle or a bottle that may include recycled and virgin plastic. And then what's happening in terms of migration, um, it's also important for recycled content is that because the plastic is going to be degraded, it may actually uh, be more of a problem in terms of contamination because beyond chemicals, you may have a degradation of the polymers that is more likely to leach again into the, the food or the water. Um, Thank you very much for the those two clarification and in addition. Um, there are more questions also comparison with other countries and the regions in the world. I propose that we keep them for later and um, so that we can have our third presentation uh, from, uh, from Raul. Um, so Raul, you, you're going to tell us a bit more about um, a specific campaign uh, that happened, but also um, yeah, the, keep elaborating on this the migration of the hazardous chemicals. Um, and also going back on the, the lack of transparency um, on, the, on daily products. So Raul, I invite you to share your screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will share my screen later. Uh, first of all, I will present the, uh, sorry, no, okay. So I will do a presentation of 10 minutes. I uh, split this presentation in, in three points. First of all, I will, explain why we think it was necessary this campaign. After that, we will check the results that we have. And finally, I will speak a little bit more about what Reservo um, uh, demands to the, to the administration and to the industry and, uh, and all that. So we, we started this campaign because uh, as you know, under the pretext of hygiene and protection, uh, uh, plastic containers, takeaways, overpackaging have risen a lot in the food sector. But the question is, uh, that are only advantage in the use of, of these plastics uh, in the food industry? So we, we already know that no, no? indeed there are uh, a lot of uh, natural effects uh, affecting the ecosystem, especially in the marine system. But there are also a lot of scientific studies that claim that plastics components are present in our body. And, and this can have uh, uh, health effects. So even if we can find a lot of these studies, uh, it seems there is a lack of transparency to the consumer about the chemicals effects in, in, in our daily products because they know a lot, of, uh, a lot about the natural effects ecosystems, but they don't really know that it, it, it is affecting in, in our health. Uh, indeed, there are a lot of prestigious international organizations that warn of the health problems caused by pollutants related with uh, to components of plastics products. Uh, for example, the American Chemical Society or the European Chemical Agency. Uh, as you know, all plastics contains uh, uh, chemicals components that industry use as additive, no? as additive to produce the plastic. And that's why uh, uh, there are as many plastics in, in, the, in the market because with this uh, additive, with these chemicals components, uh, they can modify the plastic and have a, a lot of different plastics, different properties, different flexibility, uh, different color, uh, different durability. No? So we know because we have uh, scientific, um, scientific studies that these chemicals components act in our body as endocrine disruptors. And these chemicals can have negative effects in our body. The main effects that, uh, that produce these chemicals components are obesity, diabetes, 
and reproduction problems. But there are also other, other effects related with the exposition of these uh, chemi chemical products. No? So knowing that, uh, Re Resero launched this campaign to demonstrate that this plastics is present in our body. And that's why we collect uh, 20 urine samples. Uh, so 20, the P of 20 volunteers. All volunteers were opinions leaders recognized in different fields. Uh, uh, artists, performers, environmental uh, activists, meteorologists, singers. Indeed, now is the time that to, to share my, my screen to show the presentation. And like that, we can check the results of this campaign. First of all, I will show you uh, all volunteers that participate in the Catalan in the in the Catalan campaign and also in the Balearic campaign. I know there are some people listening from Pamplona, Barcelona, Palma, Ibiza, Catalonia that are watching this this webinar. So for sure they they will recognize some of these people. No? Some of them, for example. Uh, some of them have TV shows like this guy, Haldur Mar, some are singer, uh, Ruben Sierra. This, these are the participants of Catalonia uh, campaign. And these here are the participants on, of the Balear campaign. Hmm? And you can check here, uh, Pau de Bon is a singer. Maybe some people from other part of, uh, of Europe know a little, a little bit about them, about, about him. Uh, there, there is also a journalist. Uh, well, artists. Mm. These are all twenty participants of this uh, of this campaign. No? So, once we had these twenty samples, what we did is to send these samples to the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. This laboratory is one of the best laboratories uh, in in the world detecting this kind of chemicals components. Uh, the results of, of, this, of this analysis was also supervised, supervised by the team of Dr. Miquel Porta. Uh, Dr. Miquel Porta is uh, the doctor in preventive medicine and public health, and he is the coordinator of the Hospital Institute of Medicine Research in Barcelona. He, for example, was also the president of the Spanish Association of Epidemiology, and he was also president in the European Federation of Epidem Epidemiology. So, uh, this uh, the, the team of Dr. Miquel Porta um, worked with the results, and and. And, and we, we had the results uh, at the end of, of, of the campaign, and they were very shocking. And I will show you on the, on the next, on the next uh, slide. No? So the results of the urine samples uh, were these ones. You can see. Uh, we, we, I, I think I forgot to say that we, we have analyzed 15 ephthalates and 12 phenolic components. Uh, this, as, as I said before, these are, uh, these, these are additives that the industry use to produce a plastic. So in all the, the results are, are, are these ones, no? In all 20 samples that, that we that, that we that, that we ana analyze, the hundred percent of the samples were positive. So in all samples, we find chemicals components. The number of compounds detected per individual range between a minimum of 20 and a maximum of 23, of 27, of a total of 27 uh, chemical components. Okay, so uh, specifically, we detect uh, we detected all ephthalates, and we detected five of the 12 phenolics components in each individual in each sample okay and there are only three phenolics components this one here bpf bpb and bpaf that we have not detected on the urine on the p of, of these samples okay 
So the, the concentration of, the, of, of this component is, is very bad that I will show you in the next slide. Here you can check on the, on the left the concentration of the 15 phthalates in this, in this, um, in this analysis and the concentric concentration of six phenols that we have detected. No? So even if we, if we have a lot of evidence that these components played as endocrine disruptors inside, inside our body, there is no knowledge which concentrations begin to be harmful. No? This means, uh, well, sorry, there is also unknown uh, the effect that the substance can have when they interact between each other. So when we have more than 20 chemical components inside our body, we don't know how they, are, uh, how they interact uh, between each other. No? Uh, so these are the results, no? and with these results, uh, we we showed in our in our media in Reserve Media, and we have a lot of, of impact. No, the, the impact of this, uh, I think, yes, I have spoken already ten minutes. So very quick, uh, we have a lot of impact in media. We, we uh, this this campaign have uh, have shown on TV on TV media on TV news on newspapers on radio no? and, and in a lot of places. And with this campaign, Reservo, uh, sorry, uh, just 30 seconds, uh, with these campaigns, uh, the, purpose, the purpose of these campaigns is that uh, we understand that the, there is a lot of, of difficulties to, to find products with us plastics uh, in the market, and that's why our, uh, we claim to the administration uh, through through this legislation the need to guarantee the right of of, of the consumer uh, to consume without generating waste. No? And uh, of course, we we also claim more resources to have to have more research about about the. Uh, about the effect of, of these chemical compounds. Sorry, maybe I, I was a little quick, but I, ha I had a lot of things to explain, um, <laughs> and this is everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cheryl. I think you can stop sharing your screen. Um, I, and just as a, as a once you're done, um, the results that you 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 had were beyond your. Um, Shockingly beyond your expectations, um, and the what what do we expect after this campaign beyond the raising awareness on the issue? Uh, well, it's true. It, for me, it was quite shocking, and I think for our technician from Resero, it was shocking. But it's true that Mikel Porta and other scientists uh, on the field told us that, of course, we were going to to have. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of positive uh, uh, answers in in the detection of these of these chemicals on these chemicals in our in our body. Um, we we have showed these results to, to to the consumer, and we expect to, to that the administration works with the industry. And as Justin and Sitzlate said before, we hope uh, that they work together and they find solutions uh, to not use these chemicals components, or at least uh, I hope they can. Uh, well, um, we, we can we can ensure the the principle of um, sorry uh, of um, uh, pre precaution no to, to 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 not expose to to some chemicals if we don't know uh, the, the the effects in our health. Thank you very much. Um, you can you elaborate why would you speak those the phthalates and the phenols? Why specifically those uh, those ones? Sorry, I lost uh, I lost the question. Sorry, I was saying because you you uh, you focused on the phthalates and phenols. Um, could you clarify why uh, you picked those ones specifically? 
Okay, yes. Uh, this, uh, we, we have chosen 27 chemical components, but there are a lot of chemical components that the industry use. Indeed, we have seen in the presentation of seed, seed cell uh, that there are more than 148 hazardous uh, chemicals, no? Something like that, I think you said. Uh, but we focus in these chemicals that we think that we, there are more, more presence in the, in the daily products. Um, that's why we choose uh, 15 phthalates and 12 phenolics. And the impact in the, in the body is the same. They, they, act, they act as endocrine disruptors in our, in our body. No? It's true there are a, a, a small difference between the, the two comp uh, components, chemical components, because phthalates may may vary inside, inside our, our body. Uh, this means that uh, what the phthalate that we excel in the urine, maybe it's, it's different than the, the phthalate that we intake. Whereas phenol, if we, if we intake BPA, we excel BPA. No? But the, the, the effect is the, the health, the effect is the same. They act as endocrine disruptors. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my colleague Agnese was mentioning in the, in the chat that the objective now is to replicate this, uh, what we did in Spain in, uh, in six other countries um, in some different yeah, member states. So uh, the result will be shared in September. Um, so we are also looking forward to see the, the results from other countries. Um, thank you very much. I um, Just the last comment on this. For you, the, the objective will be to have this, bring this visibility on on daily products that consumers know exactly what they're buying or what you would see from a change or possible change for at the consumer level? Yeah, uh, uh, of, uh, of course. I, I said before that there is a lack of transparency for the consumer to know which are the additives that the industry use to, to, uh, to these daily products. So, Yes, one of our demands is that we want to know which are the additives that they are using in each of the of the of the daily products that we consume. Thank you very much. Thanks for the the three presentations and um, and all the information that you provide already at the stage. There are a lot of questions and comments. Um, some of them are broader than others, so. We'll take a few, say, technical questions, um, and then we then want also to talk about how we can influence the situation. Uh, so I'm just going to, to share a few of the, say, more technical questions. There was one question, I think it is for you, Sitzel, um, rather like, is there a position on the use of uh, fluorochemicals in FCMs, and should they be restricted? Well, the, the fluorochemicals uh, are also those chemicals that are called uh, the forever chemicals because they do not degrade in the environment. And the fluorochemicals were also those that were, that were described in the Hollywood movie with Dark Waters that maybe some of you have, have seen. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are really some of the most uh, problematic chemicals uh, in the world. And you can say that, that it, in that way, it's very strange that we use them in food contact material. They are, to my knowledge, mostly used in paper, paper and board, like pizza boxes and salad bowls from takeaway restaurants and so on, to, um, to avoid a greasy feel of the material. And uh, both NGOs and member states have been very much uh, concentrating on these uh, chemicals and I know actually now that the Netherlands is working on a ban on on fluor, uh, fluorinated substances and Denmark my own country has notified a ban to the EU that they will not accept the uh, fluorinated chemicals in, in food contact materials so this is really the first time that a that a member state has taken such a step and it shows that that it's possible um, and also a very good way that Denmark has done it, as far as I think, is that they have uh, focused on the whole group of fluorinated substances, just saying, we really do not want these forever chemicals to float around. And uh, I like very much a quote that the, that the Dutch minister said when she, when she was uh, presenting this ban, she said, 
do we really need uh, this chemical just to prevent uh, that the cheese sticks to the pizza box? So there's also here really a, a kind of a, a proportionate discussion of proportions, like maybe we need fluorinated chemicals for some essential uses, but these may not include the food contact materials, in my view. So, so I think this is really something that, that is already moving, but as NGOs, of course, we need to, to move on. And the last thing I would like to say for this is that I heard somebody from, from food contact industry say, that's all very well, but then you will get a greasy feeling. I mean, the box will not feel as good if they cannot use these chemicals. And um, I don't know how true that is, and I don't know what is the, really the compromise. If, some innovative industries might find a, a good alternative or not. But still, I mean, sometimes it's, it may be more important to not use the chemicals than to have a non-greasy food contact material. That was a long talk, sorry, but. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. And I think this connects also with, with some other questions on um, yeah, the, the chemicals and the use and, and going back to the use rather than the product is probably what we, we need to do, and especially if we think from a systems perspective. Um, there are a few questions related to the recycled materials. Um, and I don't know if, if uh, you or Justine or yeah, who would like to answer that one. It's, it's going back to this, and I think it would be a clarification to make, but which recycled materials can be used to produce food contact materials? Yes, um, so there's different answers to that. It depends on the material. Um, so for plastic, um, just briefly what we said earlier is that there's, um, if you want to use recycled plastic, um, a number of facilities for and recycling processes are allowed to produce this recycled plastic for food contact material. So basically your recycling uh, has to be uh, authorized by EFSA and the commission um, and only those can. And what we have seen until now, it's mainly PET uh, recycling. For other materials, um, because there's no EU harmonized legislations, for example, on paper, what we see is that a lot of recycled paper is used in food contact material um, and this is not necessarily from food contacts, um, and that brings a number of issues uh, with mineral oil, for example, that is come from the inks of newspaper and others that may have contaminated the paper um, recycling industry. Thank you very much. Um, there are a few questions around uh, the systems that are safe, um, um, and I guess this also relates to the the current um, crisis, sanitary crisis we're in. Um, so there are, I think, two or three questions, including questions on YouTube, where saying that industry lobby groups are arguing that single use is safe, reusables are risky in the context of COVID. Uh, how concerned are you about this? And um, we are also aware of today um, SMEs who are already replacing reusables. Um, so this, this whole question around uh, safety of reusable sources, single use. Um, yeah, I can start. Um, I think, I mean, first of all, it, it's complicated in the sense of it's very new. And I think uh, there's a lot of statements, but overall caution is, is should be the, the main word because we, we're learning every day about how the virus actually transmits and behaves on, on materials, etc. But um, a few things I can, I can say is that um, the, the, the studies have showed that indeed uh, materials can uh, be a vector of transmission of the virus, even though the main vector remains the air, and it seems more and more that it goes into that direction, hence the, uh, all the measures around uh, protecting wearing a mask, etc. cetera. Um, but in terms of surfaces, yes, they could, it seems the virus could stay viable on, on surfaces. And there's studies that shows that the, the virus can stay actually viable longer on some surfaces like plastic than on others. Um, but there's no distinction between whether the surface is a single use packaging or a reusable cup, uh, for example. So there's, there's no difference. Um, so yes, reusable packaging could possibly act as a vector, but not much or less 
uh, than, uh, than a single use package. Um, and so it, it's very much about ensuring those reusables are clean. Um, and there's indeed concern at the moment with the bring your own, uh, because I think some um, uh, companies, they just want to make sure they take as much uh, security as they can. But in a way, there's no more, no risk with someone bringing your, your own container uh, rather than uh, the, the waiter or the waitress uh, touching the reusable one. It's, it's a lot about the trust of, of clean or not. But it also shows that bring your own has its own limits and that it, it shows that if we want to develop reusable systems, we, we have to go for systems and not just bring your own. It has to go back to the producers, be sanitized professionally and then be again uh, used. So I think it shows this limitation. Um, but at the moment, reusable as, as safe as single use when it comes to that. Thank you very much. Uh, does any of you want to add on this question? No? Perfect. Um, so I'll move to the, to the next one. Um, thanks for still sharing your, your questions online. Um, there's a question that uh, relates to how well we're doing or how well are doing the others. Uh, we discussed a lot about Europe. Um, so it's about Spain and, and we heard also from uh, other countries. So do you have a sense of the legislation in other regions in the world or other countries? Um, do you have like a, a comparison? Yes, Cesar, yeah. Well, um... Uh, if you remember the consensus statement that, that Justine was mentioning uh, from 33 scientists, these scientists were actually not only from Europe, they were also from the US. And I think there was a, a few also from one from Canada and a few from um, Southeast Asia. So that uh, indicates that the problem is the same all over. And I know also that NGOs in the EU, they work much with the NGOs in the US, mostly are those that I know about. And um, more or less, you can say the type of the problems are the same, but the legislation is not exactly the same. The, in the US, they see a chemical that has migrated as a food additive, which is a very strange wording, but that's, that's how it is in legal sense, as I understand. And they have some concept that's called that some chemicals are generally recognized as safe, which is a kind of authorization system. But uh, it's really not something that you should take my word for, for uh, the final answer, but it's just what I heard about it. And um, the last thing I can say about it is that I, I also have the impression that sometimes companies in the EU look to some legal acts in the US and ask their suppliers if the chemical that they receive would comply with US laws just to get a sense of, okay, so would this comply, for instance, with the California Act of, on carcinogens? And if the supplier can they say, yes, it would, then they have more information about the safety of the product. So, so you can use a sort of, use, you can use the other country's legislation as a baseline or something that you can ask about in the supply chain. Thank you. Maybe staying on this, this question that goes um, beyond the European border. So here we're discussing legislation that has an impact in Europe. Uh, but what about imported products? Um, how can we, are there rules for that? Or um, how can we ensure the safety of those products that are imported on the European market? Well, the simple, question, the simple answer is that, is that the EU legislation uh, also goes for imported products. So the importers will have to comply. That's the basic answer you say. Yeah. How Anyone else? Works, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think building on this indeed. And so it goes back to some of the limitations we mentioned, we mentioned earlier is that the EU legislation, we have a framework, but then um, when it comes to real measures and migration limits, etc., it's only regulated for plastic. Um, so the same thing um, for imports, that means that for other materials, when it's going to be imported, it's going to depend on in which country it reaches the EU. And then from there, it's free circulation. So the risk is that the import is in a country that has 
lower rules. So not Denmark, for example, but another country. And then from there, because there's this rule of kind of mutual recognition between the different countries in the EU, it will be able to go anywhere. So there may be this risk of importers choosing uh, really the, the lower denominator, I would say. And then as, as we mentioned earlier with traceability and transparency and, and along the value chain and the supply chain, obviously the, the longer the value chain, the harder it is to even trace uh, to, to trace really what, what's happening. And, and often we only have this declaration of compliance, which really doesn't say much about really what assessment has been done. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we're covering the, the policy framework, we're covering the offer, um, um, like what producers can do this, redesigning the systems and making sure we're not only about, it's not about bringing your own container, um, as some of you mentioned. And there are questions when it relates to consumer, at the consumer level right now. And I think this one um, could be for you, Raul. Um, one of the question is, what are the ways today to really reduce our exp exposure to chemical components? Um, and in your research, do you have any ideas or um, were you also yeah. thinking to go to step two on the other solutions? Yeah, yes, well, of, of course there are, there are different uh, exposure uh, routes. Uh, it can be uh, uh, through well, environmental, uh, from food, from medical devices, from food contact materials. But I will focus in food contact materials and food uh, because I think it's uh, the, 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 the first uh, intake that, uh, that, that we have of these uh, chemicals components. So if we can't buy uh, our product without plastic that I think nowadays is quite difficult because the, the administration do not guarantee uh, uh, that, that we can buy uh, our, uh, our daily product without waste. If we can't do that, uh, we can reduce our exp exposure doing a few things maybe. Uh, what we can try to do is, is not to consume a lot of uh, um, well, of, of um, fast food, like fast food, like if we go to to places with fast food, uh, we we should try to avoid it, and we shall try to avoid uh, to consume uh, processed food, uh, and we also we should try to to not heat uh, plastic in our microwave. If we have containers, uh, plastic containers and we have food on it, we should remove the food from the container before putting it in a microwave, for example. And with that, I think we can avoid uh, a little bit more our exposure uh, about these chemicals components. Thank you very much. I um, we understand that the campaign you were running was also to raise awareness. Um, so here we are in a, in a place where most of the people are now aware of the food contact materials, but not necessarily the people that you tested. Um, what, what were their, their reactions or um, did this like push them to, to, to change yeah. some of their consumer behaviors? Yes, of course, there were a little bit of everything in our volunteers because some of them were uh, scientific, for example, and uh, they were a little bit more conscious about, about that. But uh, for all of them, the results were shocking because most of, most of them didn't expect to have uh, as many chemical components inside, inside the body. And um, yes, some of them has asked us how they can reduce uh, the ex exposition, but there is not a, a, a simple solution, no? So as I said, we can do, Few things, but it's very difficult to know to know consume this kind of, of chemicals because we find in the environment and in contact with our food very uh, and also in, in different devices in contact with different devices and it's very difficult to 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 not uh, intake this kind of, of chemicals components. But of course, there are a lot of people that uh, through the, this campaign have contact with zero and have asked what they can do. 
uh, what are the solutions, but it's not only the consumers that need to do things to not have uh, these chemicals components in the body. It's also industry and administrations that have to work together and try to find solutions to that. Absolutely, and I and I wanted to, to touch base on this part. I think uh, clearly the message that we are sending here, it's, it's not necessarily, and it's not the responsibility of the consumer. Um, the chemicals and some of the products should just not be on the market. Um, and there are actually questions um, um, in the Q&A part, like who does it take? What does it take? Who are the stakeholders to make that happen? Um, like in your views, what are the other stakeholders that, that we need to bring on around the table for a new legislation, work on the potential loopholes, uh, or even address the global regulation question? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I, I think it, it uh, does not happen only with these food contact materials. It have happened uh, always, no? for example, with the cars and the plomb in the cars. No? Uh, first, the industry produced and the legislation seems to be uh, a little late, no? I and mean, it's very difficult once uh, these products are in the in the market. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to, to 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 create a new legislation about that, and that's why I think the most important thing uh, what should happen is is to is is all industry should uh, should uh, should follow the principle of pre prevention. If we don't know. Well, which is the, the, the effect in our health or in the environment or whatever, we shouldn't use this product. Thank you. I want to give the chance to uh, Cecil and Justine to add on this question. So as I understand, sorry, just in the, uh, as, uh, as I understand, you are asking what should different stakeholders do to, to uh, promote that we get a reform of the FFM legislation quicker? Yeah, either individually, collectively, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, we it's the commission who needs to take a step. They need to take a step forward to, to bring about some proposals for new legislation. They have had the evaluation and people are now waiting for them to, to move on and propose something and, and uh, Maybe when the farm to fork strategy comes uh, in a few weeks, we will see what they are thinking about doing. But I also think that the member states, the individual member states, could maybe push a bit more than they are doing. The member states, in my view, seem to be very sort of, um, what do you call it, giving up. It's like they don't work on how things could be in the future. They don't look for solutions. and. They don't uh, contribute with any ideas or solutions on how a future EU legislation could be. Although all the member states, as far as I understand, really do like to see more harmonization at the EU level, but they're not really putting any energy or resources into this work. And I, I would really call on them to do so. For industry, maybe they shouldn't be dragging their feet so much because actually harmonized rules it's also uh, acknowledged by many industry partners that harmonized rule would be better for them. It would create a better internal market. But industries, my claim would be that they're sort of dragging their feet by principles. And maybe they could stop doing that and be a little bit more also positive and contribute positively towards a new legislation. Yeah, and NGOs and the public, we just need to maybe bring the word to the public so that the public knows more about this situation. Yeah. Thank you. Justine, do you want to add anything? Sure, maybe. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, raising awareness and that's what a lot has been said and then go to the next level. I think what is really interesting with the FCM topic is despite the fact that it's very niche and very technical, it's actually at the core of so many key things in our lives. It's about food, it's about health, it's about environment and it's really about um, how if we it's, it's actually a key piece to really ensure that we have safe food in, in, in reusable and good packaging or no packaging if there's no need for packaging and how this also links to you know, the circular economy and, 
and ensuring trustability along and the value chain of, and food systems in general. So um, there's really, I think, an opportunity to bring different movements around, on, around this topic, both working on, on food, but on health, because uh, as you know, Raoul mentioned, I mean, those chemicals have huge impact. They also uh, linked to um, endocrine disrupting issues, obesity, etc. And obesity is also linked to the food type of food we eat. So there's many links there. And I think there's really uh, a chance to, to bring those different movements together and to really ask with one voice, like we need to change that. We can, uh, and the commission can act on this and they should really start uh, pushing for that. Thank you. We have a little less than 10 minutes left. And um, so there are a lot of reactions in the, the, the Q&A part saying, so what is what is quicker? Like, should we like prevent all other from using the chemicals and spending time trying testing the dangers or actually promote this, the, the solutions? Uh, maybe those that have, it says clean packaging, but I also guess it also covers reusable. So where is where can we act or what is the sweet spot if there's any on this question. I mean, I would say it's both. Uh, I think, I mean, we we obviously need to, to start from uh, the start, like for example, instead of trying to make sure that uh, the recycled content is clean, uh, we should start with phasing out the, the hazardous substances from the start. So then when it goes to recycling, there's much less of a concern. Um, so I think it's there's there's a lot we know already on the topic. We know some chemicals are hazardous. Some chemicals have been restricted under chemicals regulation, which in the EU and they're still allowed in food contact materials. I think this those easy steps can really uh, easily taken and and quickly. Um, and then um, so it's that, but it's also yes, of course, showing the solutions and helping uh, the ones bringing the solution. Um, to to raise and to blossom, I would say, and, and then really address the lack the lack of information on some materials. But again, the lack of information doesn't mean we can't already act on, on many on many issues. So I would say it's it's kind of both because by showing that solutions exist, it also helps uh, the decision makers to take maybe the hardest decision sometimes, but the very needed decision for for protecting human health. Any addition on, on this question? Well, I, I can say that I very much agree with you, Justine, that the, that the, it's maybe the most important thing is to is to get a, a method to get the most hazardous chemicals out of the food contact materials first, like the endocrine disruptors and the carcinogenics or, or those that harm uh, reproduct, uh, your reproductive reproducticity and so on. But also following up from that, you can say that in the EU, we have lots of chemicals legislation on other products where you have very good examples for how to ensure safety. Like you could look to the regulation of cosmetics and you could look to REACH and you could look to the Soy, Soy Safety Directive and you can see how they have solved many of these safety issues and maybe take some examples from there and use for food contact materials. Thank you very much. Um, there are some questions going to some specific type of, of products. Um, there's, there's one that I will take among all those ones is the one related to um, bio-based bioplastics. So um, there's this question that is, is there a, any comparison on the health impact of bio-based plastics or fossil-based plastics? Um, and if, if this information is somewhere, and maybe if we want to clarify the bio-based plastics first, yeah. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, so bio-based plastic are made from uh, bio source. So um, let's say uh, corn, uh, algae is something else uh, and not fossil fuel based. So it's really about the feedstock that we use to make plastic. And I would say there's no clear answer. Um, they're not safer than fossil fuel uh, um, plastic. It really depends. But there's studies that shows that, for example, PLA and PHA have really a huge um, amount of chemicals uh, linked to them. So, um, so the simple answer is no, it's, it's not per se better from a chemical uh, point of view, um, not necessarily from a marine pollution point of view either, by the way. 
Thanks for the, the clarification, Raul. Yes, uh, just I, I want to add that also it depends on the additives that you do that you use to produce these this plastics or bioplastics. So if you are using the same additive in, in both of them, it's the same. The, the results will, will be the same for your health. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm sorry because we, there are still many questions related to to, to design product, but uh, it, we will need to, to wrap up here. Um, so I would like to maybe give the chance to um, the three panelists to share with us um, a last thought or maybe a key idea you would like to put emphasis on. Uh, we discussed about many topics. We, we discussed um, about the global regulation, the EU legislation, the different frameworks that we have today. Um, what are the the, the key actions we need to take when it comes to solutions, but also clarify, just clarifying what are food contact materials and um, and actually the issues today, um, and also sharing um, what can be done to actually uh, act on these different points. Um, so maybe I'll start with uh, with Raúl. If there's any information you would like to share in in closing this this webinar. Yes, well, um, first of all, thank you very much for this webinar. I think it was a, a lot of knowledge for everyone. Uh, yes, we have a web page uh, for our campaign. And uh, if you want, you can go there and you can check uh, the campaign. And also uh, you can check again the, 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 the results and the technical uh, procedure of our campaign. Thank you very much. Uh, Justine? Thank you. Uh, thank you all um, for participating as well and for the very interesting questions. Um, maybe a last word of more like open uh, opportunity that we have at the moment. There's many things happening uh, on food contact material. I mean, the first legislation date back from the 17th and there have been changes, but I think at the moment there's, there's really consensus on the fact that it needs to change. Um, and that we need to, to strengthen the EU rules. So I think this is very useful. And we hope that also with our project uh, testing and more, doing more testing across Europe, it will bring uh, more awareness and to keep people as well involved in those processes uh, to really uh, advance. And indeed, I think there's, there's really an interesting gathering of NGOs, both working on environmental, health, chemicals, foods um, that are really pushing for, for a strong a strong call and also a large part of the industry. Thank you very much. Cecil? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I will also just say in, in line what with others have said that that I hope that you will follow the process. You can uh, you can read much more also at the ChemTrust website and and I would also like to highlight the food packaging forums website because there's a lot of uh, good scientific information there about food packaging. And I hope that you will be inspired to, uh, to push for better food packaging legislation uh, nationally, maybe with your member state, or if you're following the EU processes, the farm to fork strategy, the chemicals uh, strategy for sustainable chemicals, and so on, that you will push for better legislation. And uh, also, I thought it's interesting what you said, Justine, that in order to get good recycling, we need to have good virgin materials. That that's really it's it, that's for me is really a key, and um, I think this is important because I think what we're really asking for is what many consumers think is there already. So it's not a in that way it's not a big ask, even though we are asking for reform. We're just asking for the logical uh, safety. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, uh, and as you were saying, it's, it's also bringing this topic in uh, um, so that we have different pe people here and participants from, uh, from very diverse backgrounds. So it, at least questioning or bringing this, this question of, of safety and health on the table, uh, no matter where the angle you, you work from. Um, so it's, it's time to, to wrap up and close. Thanks again for your, uh, your contribution and answers to, to the questions. Thanks to everyone. Um, and I'm sorry again that we could not cover all the, all the questions. Um, as said, uh, sign up to the different newsletters. You'll, you will have access to more uh, technical scientific papers. Um, so as a, 
just a, a reminder, we have monthly webinars and then next month, the 16th, we will be covering the question of deposit return schemes um, that was mentioned uh, today. So for beverage containers, I uh, invite you to, uh, to sign up. Um, you can find the link in the chat box. Um, and you can also find all the presentations and more tools on the Series Europe Academy section on our city's website. Um, so feel free, sorry, to register uh, for all this. Um, as for us, we have uh, the Series Europe policy briefing that will be released by the end of the month on the topic. So keep an eye on the, the social media for this. And as a final uh, note, um, we our little contribution in this in this time. Um, it's uh, maybe you want to learn more about some of the topics that we have here. So we decided to give free access to all of our webinars, uh, all the recordings until um, and the end of the summer. Uh, so the end of August. So we really hope that uh, this will contribute to broadening a bit your perspective or deepening your knowledge on some of the some of the topics. So you'll find the recording on the Zero Zero uh, live page uh, where you registered for this webinar. And uh, again, all the presentations uh, from the speakers will be available uh, in the coming days. Thank you very much. And uh, we look uh, forward for the next conversation. Thank you. Bye.